Today, guys, we are going to be jumping off of... Jumping off of... Jumping off of... Yes, yes. Welcome to another episode of Jumping Off Points, the podcast where we use events in the news as jumping off points to explore wider issues around politics and culture. My name is Timber. And my name is Aiden. Good to see you, Timber. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, how does it feel to be a married man? It's good. It's good. Yeah, very good. Although... Throw your M's up. Married gang. <laughs> married gang. <laughs> Just two married guys on a podcast now. Obviously, taking a break, I feel like loads has happened, you know? It's like whenever, we, whenever we're not around for a five to six week period, everything kicks off. This is the thing I always like to say about the news. It never stays still for two months. That's what I love about it, to be honest. It's one of the best things about it, yeah. Today, we are going to be giving you a brief recap of things that have happened while we've been out of the loop, and then slowly winding into a conversation about a very interesting, extravagant, flamboyant political figure from the UK. Usually, our Jumping Off Points episodes, we're more general, policy-based, Whereas this one, it feels like the intersection between my YouTube channel and this podcast has suddenly like hit a dead crossroads. Yeah, someone's about to get on, put on blast today. That's all we can say. <laughs> As many of our listeners will know, Boris Johnson was under investigation by the Privileges Committee in Parliament to assess whether or not he had misled Parliament over his behaviour during the coughing illness. I want to help you to understand whether I deliberately set out to deceive. And I emphatically did not. The committee found that he had misled Parliament over this. This is a man who is a serial liar. The committee recommended that he was suspended from Parliament for 90 days. The eyes to the right, 354. The nose to the left, seven. For an MP to be called into a by-election, they only have to be suspended for 10 days from Parliament. So Boris Johnson knew that he was going to be recalled into a by-election and the polls show that Labour were are very likely to win that. And into that gap, we have this figure, Lawrence Fox. And that is today's jumping off points, folks. The actor slash musician slash politician, Lawrence Fox, who is running, uh, representing the Reclaim Party in the Uxbridge <laughs> Ricelip by-election. So I think our UK audience Given that Lawrence Fox had a burst of media headlines uh, a few years ago, I think they'll be, probably be aware of who he is. But our American audience, I think probably not. Who do you think he's closest to in terms of like US political commentators? Milo Yiannopoulos is the closest. Yes. In the sense that Milo Yiannopoulos, by profession, when he rose to fame, was a journalist. But he didn't get headlines for anything he did in journalism. It was always some sort of statement or Twitter post that stoked the fires of the culture war that actually brought him to prominence. And that is where Lawrence Fox is. Yeah, he's a provocateur. Provocateur, yeah. So who is Lawrence Fox? Before we get into the politics, let's give you a little walk through his career. So Lawrence Fox was mostly known for playing DS Hathaway in the ITV detective drama, Lewis. Hathaway, find me some dead people. Sir? Crime now. Inspector Lewis gets his wish with the discovery of what appears to be the suicide of Hugh Mallory's wife. Which was a spin-off of the drama Inspector Morse, which occupies a very special place in UK culture. All of our mums watched it. If you're in the house in the middle of the day on like an idle Thursday and you're retired and you're watching TV, Inspector Morse is what's on TV. I have to say, I've heard the name Inspector Morse. I've never heard of Lewis. Have you heard of it before? No, never. And to give you some idea, so my mum, she's retired. She's exactly the audience I just described. She spent, she's got endless time to spend watching TV in the middle of the day. And she likes just vegging out watching these shows. I was going back to my hometown to spend some time with, uh, with mum and dad. Walked in on a room where mum had the TV on and Lawrence Fox was on TV. <laughs> Obviously, I'd heard of Lawrence Fox from, you know, his political views and him being a provocateur. Suddenly saw him on TV. And was like, oh, right. So he was an actor. And I was like, mum, what is this? What is this show? And she was like, oh, I don't know. Why? Who is he? So even my mum, who's the target audience for this show, doesn't know the name of the show he's in and doesn't really know his name. And, uh, yeah. and also, if you hear him describe his acting career, it was very successful. At peak acting career, he had the popularity of someone in a soap like EastEnders or Emmerdale. But not Emmerdale. as big as that. Not as big as EastEnders. Yeah. Not as big as EastEnders. Which is... 
Possibly surprising, given that he comes from a very well-connected elite acting family. His father is the actor James Fox, who I think was really big in, in films in like the 60s. His cousin is Amelia Fox, who's in Silent Witness. I think his brother was in Fresh Meat. Um, his brother-in-law is Richard Ayoade from the IT crowd. Yeah, Richard Ayoade is the one who plays Moss in the IT crowd. I actually love that guy. It does also make me think that maybe Lawrence Fox's family aren't all mental as well. Yeah, Richard Ayoade is married Lawrence Fox's sister, right? So I know, Lawrence but Fox's I'm like, sister, would he marry can... into a crazy family? Probably That's not. what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Kind of the odd one out. But I guess the if your dad's an actor... Your cousin's an actor. They're all famous in their own right. The pathway in terms of industry connections and everything is easy. Actually, let me be clear. Not that Lawrence Fox is a bad actor in, in the TV show Lewis. It, he fits fine in that role. But um, to say that he came from rags to riches as an actor would be untrue. Um, so the show Lewis, which was his main show, ran from 2006 to 2015. And when I go through his IMDb credits and his Wikipedia page, it seems to me like his acting appearances became few and far between after that. He had a few appearances here and there, uh, sometimes in shows that were quite big, but in one-off episodes. And he didn't have any permanent reoccurring roles after the time where he left Lewis. Me and Aiden, outside of this podcast, we both have our own music careers. And the same goes for Lawrence Fox. Unfortunately, he's not making UK Garage. Um, <laughs> he's, he had, hmm, I don't want to say unsuccessful, but quite short career as a singer songwriter in terms of his songs where would you put him what what like singer songwriters close to i really don't know but it's like he's really leaning into that like sort of gruff masculine energy but his songs sound a little bit like they want to be coldplay covers or something like they're very like popular folksy yeah so in terms of his voice i'd say bruce springsteen in terms of his lyrics Ed Sheeran. Yes. Uh, so, but not, not, not as good, obviously. It's like he is as an actor. He's not a bad singer. Very serviceable as a singer-songwriter, but he wouldn't be out of place in the corner of a pub. Oh, yeah. His songs are like, they're of, they're of, they're of this sort of cadence and quality. We've all got problems. <laughs> all of us do. But I'm gonna play my guitar and sing for you. <laughs> That's the kind of songs we're talking about. That is exactly the type of songs that we're talking about. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you'd stolen that off of one of his albums. He had a lot of articles when he came out with this album in 2016, having been fresh off Lewis in NME, so quite a big music publication, in various broadsheets as like a music review. But in all of them, the spectre of his wife... Oh, so this is something we haven't even mentioned. He was married to Billy Piper. Billy Piper was a really, really famous musician for a time in the UK. And actor, right? Yeah, in, in quite a lot of successful shows. She was also in that realm of like Fern Cotton. I think she became an idol for a lot of young women during that time and, and onwards. So in all of these articles where they talk about his new release, this comes up again and again. Husband of Billy Piper. Yeah. Husband of Billy Piper. <laughs> it's the like, guy who's married to Billy Piper. It's like the exact opposite of what normally happens, you know, like normally famous men's wives are just seen as arm candy or whatever right <laughs> it's kind yeah. of it's kind of like lauren fox is just an afterthought underneath yeah. <laughs> billy piper's name in, in several places having not been tuned into the singer songwriter scene or lawrence fox at that time me and aiden both into uk underground music we don't really follow singer songwriters that well i was curious to see metrics on you know how successful was that career so i went on wayback machine and just got a screenshot of uh his spotify in 2018 to put it bluntly he wasn't setting the world on fire he had 2,400 followers on Spotify and just over 1,000 monthly listens. And to give you some context for those kinds of listens, that's the amount of plays that I get on SoundCloud now. I am not married to Billy Piper. I have not been in the hit TV show. I do not have a famous family. <laughs> you do have a very successful YouTube account though, Tim. You know I know, I mean? yeah, yeah, <laughs> to be fair, yeah. You're famous, you're famous to a small group of nerds online. I get, well, I guess that's a, it's a perfect comparison in that sense. I was, I've achieved success in one online dimension and my, and my SoundCloud has just leveraged that success mm. and it results in 1,000 monthly pay, plays, which is to say, I haven't set the world on fire with my music. Yeah. But I don't call myself a musician. Yes. And also, you kind of feel like, for Lawrence Fox, the reason he gets into music is because he still wants to be famous, right? Obviously, he doesn't say that, but there's kind of the vibe that I get is that he wasn't getting a lot of acting work. He still wants to be known by people, so he gets into music. And then, 
after he's into the music for a while, he has a new area that he wants to be known in. You are dirty. Everything changed for Lawrence Fox in January 2020 when he appeared on an episode of a UK politics show called Question Time. So Question Time is a political debate programme hosted at different places around the country. The BBC pull on politicians, like local politicians, and then but also spokespeople for different causes, and they answer questions from the audience as well as debating each other on the in the panel. The issue of Meghan Markle was being debated. And so Meghan Markle is obviously the wife of Prince Harry. Fox was asked a question and he argued that she was not a victim of racism. When this conversation continued, an audience member accused him of having white privilege. And he then said it was a racist statement to say that someone has white privilege. I was born like this. It's an immutable characteristic. So to call me a white privilege male is to be racist. You're being racist. He also, during the panel, said a lot of very populist things. Like he took aim at other actors for flying around the world and having a lot of carbon emissions, but also telling other people to reduce their carbon emissions. Interestingly, actually, said that he fancied Keir Starmer as the next Labour leader. Which Labour candidate, if any, do you believe can reconnect with lost voters in the North? Who should replace Magic Grandpa? Um, <laughs> Keir That's Starmer. original. That's original. Keir Starmer. <laughs> Keir Starmer gets your vote, would he? And what, why Keir? He just looks like he can take Boris on quite well. Um, so I feel like at that time, his politics were less crazy than they've gone on to be. Anyway, when we looked at a Google Trends search to find out how much attention Fox had been getting prior to this appearance on Question Time and then after it, there was a huge surge in people Googling Lawrence Fox's name after this Question Time appearance. And for me, this is when he really hit the news, right? This is when everything changed for him. He often refers to, I gave up a successful acting career off the back of that Question Time performance because I wasn't allowed to act anymore, blah, blah, blah. You look into Google Trends, he wasn't getting any sort of attention even at the peak of his acting career that compared in any way to January 2020 after the Question Time appearance. This is not the story of someone who is already massively famous going against the woke mob. It's the story of someone whose acting career was functionally over having a renaissance in attention in the press. Yeah, so he just released a new album, right, at the end of the previous year, so the end of 2019. And when he was promoting that album, he did an interview with the Times newspaper, and he told the journalist that he'd been totally radicalized by watching YouTube videos. And I can totally see this, right? It totally makes sense in terms of his trajectory, because he goes from being like, clearly a bit of an idiot, but he goes quite quickly to being a very outspoken provocateur. This is the expediency of his shift. In 2017, he voted for Jeremy Corbyn, who is woke, socialist, as Lawrence Fox would say, he wants to drive a wedge in society between the haves and the have-nots and divide everyone. And just a few years before his appearance on Question Time, he voted for that guy. And bear in mind, this was when Brexit had already happened. This was when Donald Trump had already happened. That cultural shift we saw, and I witnessed, because I was active on YouTube communities from a long time back, from 2014. I saw Gamergate unfold. I saw all these cultural shifts. He was part of the lineage of time with me and obviously was not put off by the left during all that time enough to not vote for the most far left candidate that existed. Yeah, kind of an interesting point. When he was promoting the album as well, I think someone asked him, as people do to to musicians, they ask him like random fucking questions. Then someone asked him like, who would be your dream dinner party guests? And he said he would invite Jordan Peterson and Kathy Burke, and then he would sit back and watch, which is obviously a reference to that video of Jordan Peterson um, essentially, well, how would you how would you describe that video? It's a, it's an interview where she asks about his beliefs, and it's a very classic UK journalist style where you hold people's feet to the fire and you've said this. Do you understand that some people might perceive that as anti woman? Yeah. In this interview, Jordan Peterson was like, "Oh well, ask me what I mean. Don't uh, don't accuse me of saying things that I've not said." Blah blah. blah. Got a lot of attention off the back of it. That video is really popular with one specific crowd and they're people who don't like feminists, right? And it's kind, mm. I see it as a big part of the wormhole almost that, that YouTube takes you on to, to get you down a more right-wing path. When I hear someone who's been involved in the conservative system for a long time, following conservative electoral politics, 
a lot of their critiques revolve around UK economic issues. When I hear Lawrence Fox speak, it very much feels like a Ruben Report, Joe Rogan bingo card. And he's ticking off all the different areas. Yeah. Leftism is a woke religion that has replaced real religion, which is Christianity that we abandoned. The environmental crisis is engineered by elites and it's part of an ESG plan to plunge society into darkness. These are just not big talking points in the UK. It's classic internet conservatism, isn't it? Mm. That kind of transcends nation borders, right? It's just like general culture war talking points. He doesn't have any specifics. Yeah. Like that, and that's true of all his political campaigning. He doesn't do specifics. As, as we kind of touched on there, end of 2019, start of 2020, it was a really big turning point for him. He also was interviewed on New Culture Forum, which seems to be a bit of a wacky YouTube channel. But he, in this interview, complains that um, he received an email from RADA, which is the drama school that he attended, which was calling for script submission, I think for TV shows or films. And the email stated that they were particularly interested in hearing from people who identified as female and they wanted scripts with a lot of female representation in them. Uh, and he took huge offense to that uh, and had a row with the, with the school on Twitter about it. All this change in Lawrence Fox's public persona led to him being dropped by his talent representation, um, authentic talent in March 2020. And then he was also dropped by his new representatives artist rights group in November 2020. And obviously, Lawrence Fox's narrative going forward has been that he was cancelled by the woke left. And that's why he's now in politics. But to me, it's clear that if you stop being an asset to a company, for whatever reason, they're going to drop you. Especially given that he wasn't an actor at this point. I don't think he was acting at anything. That's not being cancelled. That's just not being wanted. So I think it's worth a little bit of time going through part of the document entitled Lawrence Fox's Twitter Obsession. Because this, I think, became really his main career, Twitter. 100%. And this comes through in so many ways in all the interviews he was doing back then. Um, so I want to just take you through one event in which there's lots of whimsical things to pick up on and also gives you a little bit of an insight into the way Lawrence Fox speaks about events and puts his own spin on them. In September 2020, the BBC made a decision that during the proms, which is a very, very posh, very, very British event where we put on a classical orchestral day, we have choirs singing, we have violinists playing, we have 10 maids of milking. <laughs> and basically it's a cultural touchstone for the UK to say, here's culture in the UK, here's us treasuring our past while bringing it forward into the present. The BBC made a decision um, to play Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory as instrumentals, devil mixes, instead of having people sing the words. And the reason they did this was because it had some lyrics that, that were a bit culturally insensitive. I think it's the lyrics were like, we will never be slaves. It says that quite a lot. And it was during a time when we were going around the world enslaving people. And it's about about traversing the seas and finding new lands and we will never be slaves. <laughs> I'll just say on this as a brief note, I don't give a fuck about lyrics of old songs. I think it doesn't really matter. More to the point, I don't give a fuck about the proms. The only people watching it are older people the and- The same people who watch Lewis. Yeah. The same people who watch his detective series. Yeah. Basically, the BBC made this decision. Then there was a very active Twitter campaign in which Lawrence Fox played a starring role. In his very Lawrence Fox way, Lawrence Fox did not put out merely one or two tweets about it. He made it the focus of his Twitter for like a week. And eventually the BBC ended up U-turning on this decision because of the backlash. Now, what's interesting about this is an interview that Lawrence Fox did after the fact. It was like the month after or a few months after. And he's talking to this dude and the dude asked about the proms and here's a little excerpt from that interview. I was very upset about the problems. Yeah. I thought, I remembered that the chart show on the BBC do have to play the top 10, don't they? Mm -hmm. And um, so <laughs> I suggested that people perhaps could download or buy or stream uh, a particular mm -hmm. version of it, Vera Lynn's version of it. And um, I think at one point it was... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah. and eleven in the Amazon, <laughs> excuse me, download charts. So it was amazing, and I was very heartened by the fact that people stood up against it. So Lawrence Fox's genius idea is to put Land of Hope and Glory in the UK charts, so the BBC has to play it. Daily Mail 
during that period, wrote this glowing write-up in August about how Vera Lynn's version of Land of Hope and Glory was topping the charts, which isn't true. She was only in the Amazon music chart. And also, from all the screenshots I can see, she wasn't number one and two and three and four and five and six. And because there's not that many versions of the record yeah, I was that exist to buy. Yeah. So it looks like at one point she was one and two, but Lawrence Fox has taken that and massively exaggerated it from everything that I could see. But we can go beyond that and say, if you look at the UK charts in August 2020, so the actual UK charts of who sold the most records. Collating all the different platforms and sales, right? Yeah. Vera Lynn came in at 85. (laughs) So to remind you of Lawrence Fox's idea to get the BBC to play it, because they have to play the top 10. Is the top 10 the numbers between 90 and 80? (laughs) Because last I checked, it was the numbers between 10 and 1, Lawrence. Also, also, uh, just a slight point of confusion for me. What, in what, sh- on what show did the BBC have to play the top 10 tracks? On the radio. Oh, on the radio. Okay, yeah, sure. But that's what I mean. It's like, the story you've just told, I had this idea, and then guess what? I completely failed to achieve it. <laughs> that's the actual, like, that's the synopsis of what, what you've just described. But you're saying that it was like this amazing thing. So also to give you some more insight into the Amazon chart, in that same screenshot where you can see Vera Lynn number one and two, Dynamite by BTS is at number three. And that song came in at 62 in the UK official charts, 23 places higher than Vera Lynn. And the secret is that the Amazon chart calculates the top charts every 24 hours. So Vera Lynn didn't need to be even the top selling artist for August. She just had to be top on a particular day where, I don't know, what, 60 of Lawrence's followers go and buy it? (laughs) Or 100? I don't know, but it doesn't take much, right? Yeah, I hear that, yeah. But I think it's quite a good reflection of the fact that, right, so this was a story where Lawrence had an idea, failed to achieve it, but then spins it as a win and even lies about the metrics of what he was able to achieve within that loss. Yeah, I think it's it's also... Just funny because what the what the, his whole campaign proved is that even the people who really care about this issue aren't listening to the land of hope and glory that much. Do you know what I mean? Yes, <laughs> it's like yes. if they were naturally reminded that this is an amazing song that they want to listen to all the time, it would just naturally climb up the charts, right? But the fact is, they only wanted to buy it as to contribute to the campaign, right? And like. But that's not enough. You actually have to want to listen to it to get to spread it, right? I think you're right. It shows that, I mean, uh, Lawrence Fox goes on to say, the British public stood up against this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, sure, I think the BBC, you turned on their decision. That's true. But in terms of this story you're telling about it going in the charts, I mean, something hitting number one on a particular day on one specific music platform, it's not really indicative of much sentiment Wide, being widespread in the UK. Yeah, I think it kind of represents the self-aggrandizing that is present across a lot of his work, isn't it? Like, he likes to think that the public are really behind him, but it rarely turns out that that is actually the case. So so that was September 2020. Only a month later, Lawrence Fox kicked off another public affairs campaign when Sainsbury's put out a tweet promoting Black History Month. So here's the tweet. that. So for full transparency, this is the tweet that Sainsbury's put out about Black History Month. We are proud to celebrate Black History Month together with our Black colleagues, customers, and communities, and we will not tolerate racism. We proudly represent and serve our diverse society, and anyone who does not want to shop with an inclusive retailer is welcome to shop elsewhere. (laughs) Okay, okay, this is Lawrence Fox's response. Dear Sainsbury's, I won't be shopping in your supermarket ever again while you promote racial segregation and discrimination. I sincerely hope others join me. Retweet. Hashtag boycott Sainsbury's. Looking in the Sainsbury's tweet, it's really hard for me to see where they're promoting racial segregation. They say, if you don't want to shop at an inclusive retailer, we don't want you to shop here. So he put out this tweet. This tweet was then called racist by various mid-tier celebrities in the UK. Coronation Street actress Nicola Thorpe, deputy chair of Stonewall Simon Blake, and uh, Crystal, who was one of the contestants in RuPaul's Drag Race. He then responded calling all of these people paedophiles. <laughs> he ended up deleting the tweets, saying it was a distraction to the important work that needs to be done. Of, of, of responding to Sainsbury's on Twitter. <laughs> which, is a, which is weird to me, because I was like, well, what are you talking about? Because your important work is on Twitter. <laughs> all of your work is on Twitter. What else are you doing? In May 2022, he was made to pay £36,000 in legal fees 
to these people after they sued him for libel. <laughs> so that is the pre-politician life of Lawrence Fox. He's obsessed with the culture wars. He's obsessed with Twitter. And he is a provocateur. That's what you need to know about him in his personal life before he becomes a politician. If it was a novel, it would be a Faustian work about one man's descent into madness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lawrence Fox's career then takes a turn. So in September 2020, Fox announced his plan to launch a new political party. He positions it as a kind of culture war party to the right of the Tories. That's what, that's what his vision is. And he teams up with Jeremy Hosking, who... I'm not going to say by coincidence, but um, luckily for Lawrence Fox, had registered a party in March 2019 called the Brexit Express, uh, which which he which Jeremy Hosking, who is this donor, set up to welcome Conservative Party MPs who were unhappy with Theresa May's Brexit plan. So people who were to the right of Theresa May and wanted a hard Brexit, he was kind of hoping that he could attract some of them into this new party. These guys joined together. So Lauren Fox and Jeremy Hosking, who is the financial backer. By February 2020, they've changed the name officially from Brexit Express to the Reclaim Party, which is what the party is called now. The point of all new parties is that the country is in desperate need of a new political movement. That's what they all think. So that's what he says. But his promises are that he will endeavour to make our future less divisive and that it will respect the history of the UK um, and... That, they, that the party will help the British public to reclaim the nation's values. And so just to put this in context, again, for listeners, this is a guy who voted for Jeremy Corbyn, the furthest left candidate in existence in the UK in 2017. And three years later is saying that the Conservatives are not conservative enough for him. That is classic right wing YouTube hole, isn't it? Like that is... Yeah. That is... <laughs> Quite classic. So this party, they've experienced quite a lot of success, haven't they, Aiden? Oh, have they experienced success? No, they have not. So I think so far, prior to Fox announcing that he's going to run for the by-election that we're talking about today, they'd only contested three elections. So in 2021, someone called Leo Kears. Kears? What do you reckon? That's just Kears, eh? He's French. It's Leo Kears. Good night. I'm going to say Kears. I am French. I love the reclaim party. <laughs> I love the getting rid of the immigrants. That's why I support Laurence Fox. Uh, Laurence. I like watching the YouTube videos. Uh, I like the uh, Rubin Report and the Jordan Peterson. <laughs> um, yeah, so... <laughs> Monsieur Leo uh, <laughs> ran in Glasgow for the 2021 Scottish Parliament election. And in that election, he received only 114 votes, which is 0.3% of the vote share. To put that in context, the winner, the SNP, received over 18,000 votes. 114 votes is basically the amount of votes you can get just from speaking to like people on Facebook, isn't it? Me and my mate booked a left field electronic artist called Sluggerbed to play one time in Sheffield at an out of the way venue, which was an abandoned warehouse. These events are very hard to promote. It's hard to get people from the city centre to come out to these events. We managed to get 123 people down to that <laughs> event, which is more votes than Leo Kirst got in that election. The other bit of uh, electioneering they have uh, tried is Martin Daubney, who was the deputy leader of the party at the time. Um, in 2021, in North Shropshire by-election, he stood and he dramatically improved on Leo, Leo Kirst's performance receiving three times the amount of votes. Unfortunately, that is still only 375 votes, which is just 0.9% of the overall vote tally. Again, some context, the winner of that election, who was a Lib Dem candidate, won 17,957 votes. Yeah, so like they're not close to winning, but they're not even close enough to winning to scare any, like, any of the other candidates. Do you know what I mean? The other candidates... I'm not even bothered. The whole point of Reclaim is to take votes away from conservatives and therefore push conservatives to have to move to the far right on all these issues. Yeah. So far, the conservatives are looking at this and I guess it's a similar feeling to when a tiny insect lands in your beer. <laughs> You're like, ugh, this is kind of a nuisance, but I'll just take it out. I'm not that concerned about this. This isn't going to ruin the pint. <laughs> yeah, going to move on pretty swiftly. I've looked down. I'm like, ugh. But then I'm just looking back up at my mates and I'm back in the conversation drinking my beer. <laughs> so aside from those two dismal failures, 
the the most success the reclaim party have ever had was when Lawrence Fox himself ran in the 2021 mayoral election, uh, the London mayoral election. So he's challenging the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. The main focus of Lawrence Fox's campaign was his opposition to the rules that have been put in place to help the country deal with what we are going to call the coughing illness for the sake of the algorithm. He frequently criticized the government's response to the coughing illness and encouraged people to disobey the rules that were put in place. There was a really good article published in The Spectator at that time that went over from a pretty neutral checks and balances perspective that London is the strangest place for Lawrence Fox to be launching this political campaign based on this issue. Sadiq Khan has such a big mandate in in London. The only hope of taking him down is via the Conservatives. And the way of doing that will be to put up someone who's charismatic, who's not overtly small-c conservative, and they don't highlight their conservative policies too much, right? They just present themselves as a viable, cool alternative who makes Sadiq Khan seem like yesterday's news. Now, whilst the rest of the country has fallen out of favour with a lot of those policies about the coughing illness, London was the opposite. They lapped up all that shit and the woke stuff and the far left stuff. They lapped up everything to do with that. At the same time that other constituencies were not voting for them under Corbyn, London constituencies were getting more votes than they'd ever seen before. We had David Lammy getting like 80%. We had Jeremy Corbyn getting like upwards. It's like, these are like North Korea levels of support amongst London demographics. And Lawrence Fox picks this place to launch an anti-woke campaign where everything he's saying is not going to connect with any of the people there. Yeah, I watched this interview of him. He was talking about when he was at RADA and he was saying that there was a big class issue for him there because a lot of people were didn't like that he was really posh, basically. And he, he said that it was only the middle class dads of the girls that he went to uni with that had a problem with it. But all the Liverpool brickies that he knew told him that, like, good on you, mate. It's like, one, how many Liverpool brickies did you know when you were studying at RADA? Probably not many. But two, it's like this, it's, it tells you this thing of, it's kind of the same as Boris Johnson, where he perceives himself as being a bloke's bloke and every man, someone who connects with the people. So I think he, in this campaign, thinks naturally, oh, all the sort of normal working people of London will see me as a, as a, as a fresh candidate. And it's like, mate, hey, you're incredibly posh. And you don't represent the policies that people want in London. Like, you, you're wrong on every count. It's funny you mentioned that point about the Liverpool brickies, because when I was listening to Lawrence Fox's interviews, I heard him tell so many anecdotes about people from working class or minority backgrounds just coming up to him on the street and praising him for being so right about everything. There was a street sweeper called Martin. I got stopped today by a um, street sweeper called Martin. You tell him that I'm voting for him because he's the only one who cares about me. There was an old black lady with a trolley. I was walking through the Camberwell Mall the other day and there was, you know, there was an old black lady with those with her trolley going through out of Poundland and she grabbed me by the cheeks and went, thank you. There was an albino, black, Brexiteer, gay friend. Tell my poor old albino black Brexiteer gay friend about gay rights. He's been totally cancelled by the gay community. And there was a random nondescript dude who Lawrence Fox described bursting into tears upon merely encountering him in the street. I had a man in tears talking to me on the street the other day. Really? Mm, saying how, how utterly terrified he was to say anything anymore within the circle that he worked in. And he started crying. And it's odd because, as you say... Lawrence Fox doesn't come across at all like a normal working person. I don't know if this is a heel turn or whether this is how he's always spoken. In his YouTube interviews around the time of the Question Time appearance, he's adopted this faux intellectual cadence and delivery where he's like, one does not need to be on the conservative side in order to perceive that the woke are ruining this country. One simply needs to blah, blah, blah. One doesn't want to threaten, but one wants to say... This is important. So to reclaim the conversation, one has to do that through reason. I don't, I, it, 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 one feels compelled. And it's like, who speaks like that? I doubt that you speak like that when you're not doing these inter interviews. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he's awfully posh. And I think in order to assess the strengths and weaknesses of his campaign, we need go no further than one interview that he did with 
Christopher Hope. For those who don't know who Christopher Hope is, he's the associate editor of the Daily Telegraph. Um, he has been a political correspondent for over 15 years. Interestingly, Lawrence Fox's party, the Reclaim Party, was launched in the Daily Telegraph, the same establishment that this guy, Christopher Hope, belongs to. I think Lawrence Fox accepts this interview thinking he's going to go there and meet with a very warm audience. However, Christopher Hope, or Chopper, as he's known on the political circuit, is nobody's fool. You can't be a political editor at a mainstay publication like the Daily Telegraph for that long without getting a sense of people's political instincts and what their intentions are. And he sees Lawrence Fox, and I think he thinks to himself, what is he doing? We are all we were all thinking that. We all still are thinking that. Chopper is not a woke person. He's certainly not on the side of... I mean, yeah, for the people who maybe are not aware of the UK media landscape, the Daily Telegraph is the most right-wing broadsheet newspaper that we have. So it is very firmly in line with, I would say, the right of the Tory party on issues. And what Chopper does in this interview, he frames it on the way in in a very clever way. We've got uh, literally hundreds of Telegraph subscribers, as many as 800 of, are tuning into this. It's quite a big, imagine that number in, in, a, in a room. It'd be like a pre-election rally, wouldn't it? And it'd, it'd be quite electric. So let's imagine that, that tension and buzz in the room. You're running as a political figure. I'm going to interview you like a political figure. And that sets a tone for an amazing conversation with Lawrence Fox. Chopper, first of all, goes into the interview saying this. Well, he, this time... Um, by the weekend, he could be mayor of London. He may not be, but, you know, he, he lives in hope. And I just thought to myself, as soon as I heard that, I was like, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> it's going to be a roast. Because he's undermined him just instantly on the way in as an unserious person. Um, so we get to this bit. The first question, and these are questions from subscribers, not from me, Lawrence Fox. Are you going to be London mayor? by Saturday evening when the counting is done. Well, we'll, we'll just have to see how many shy foxes there are out there, mustn't we? Um, I, I certainly think we'll probably do better than the mainstream media would give us credit for. But um, for me, it's just been an absolutely wonderful experience to sit and meet people from all over London. Very moving experience, actually. I would say that this is an answer of someone who does not believe they're going to win. <laughs> Well, if he actually believed he was going to win, that would be a delusional belief. This is the other interesting thing. The vagaries that this guy leans on. Mainstream media do not predict numbers of how much votes they think political candidates are going to get. No. All they do is say how good they think their chances are at winning. And let's make no secret of the fact that every publication fancied Lawrence Fox's chances as very slim. By saying we'll do a lot better than mainstream media think we're going to do, you're essentially saying nothing because they haven't put a metric out there and you're not putting a metric out there. So we've got no way of objectively grading how well you've done compared to what they think you're going to do. So true. Yeah. It's just an opportunity for him to get a culture war point in that the mainstream media are not to be trusted. They said they thought you were going to lose disastrously. And spoiler alert, he ends up losing disastrously. <laughs> so they were fucking correct, you know? Um, and not only that, but I, uh, this is another thing I want to call attention to here. During this race, he was very, very acidic on Twitter. Uh, he retweeted someone who said, if you vote for Sadiq Khan, if you get raped, if you get stabbed, if you get robbed, that's on you. This has been a monstrous reign of Sadiq Khan for Londoners. It has been the most terrible time in British history. If someone doesn't manage to get him out, this is going to be the end of London as we know it. And now it comes to a day before the votes when he's asked how well he's going to do. Oh, well, it's just been amazing. It's been fantastic. It's been a really nice campaign. Where's the smoke? You had so much smoke for Sadiq Khan. You had so much doom mongering about the future of London. Where's that now? If you believe that, then your answer would be, well, if I don't get in, it's the end of London as we know it. But it seems like you're not saying that anymore. Yeah, because yes, because he's starting to see that would be quite embarrassing. Yeah. And Lawrence Fox is specifically asked how well he thinks he's going to do. Listen to this next bit. What is a good result for you? Is it double digit numbers, being honest? Or do you want, not want to go there before, before people vote tomorrow? What's a good result for Lawrence Fox? I think a good result is is doing it, standing, putting together a campaign. I just think that we've said, and I'm so proud of everyone who's worked with me to, to, to put together a very positive campaign. And it's just like, that's the evasive pol politician's response. <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, we have an irrefutable metric for what a good result is. And it is the number of votes that you receive, right? Like, there's no other way to quantify how good a result you got because... 
it's built into the system. Trying to set expectations that anything else other than a high number of votes is a good result in an election is dishonest. Yeah, absolutely. Lawrence Fox is someone who on social media, he goes on about, we should be able to call a spade a spade. Politicians are wriggly, they're squirmy, they don't give straight answers. They evade responsibility through the way they speak. We see that when he's thrust into the role of a politician, Lawrence Fox is going for that exact type of response to all these questions. He's evasive. He's not giving an answer to whether he thinks he's going to win or not. He leans on pleasantries. It's been so nice meeting people. That's all I'm going to say. It's such a nice experience. It's such a nice day. Listen to this next passage about Lawrence Fox's plan for tackling crime in London. Let's let's imagine on Saturday night you're in City Hall and you've won. You're the mayor of of, of the greater city on this earth. What are your your first top three priorities once you're mayor? The next morning, I'm going to call in the chief of the Metropolitan Police and I'm going to say, you're fired. (laughs) And I'm going to hire someone else um, who is going to be Harry Miller. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you're going to police without fear or favour and London is... <clears throat> in intensive care when it comes to knife crime. Who, who, who is Harry Miller, Lawrence Fox? Harry Miller is a wonderful human being who is currently in the um, <clears throat> Court of Appeal over hate crime legislation, trying to bring down these HCOGs, these uh, non-crime hate incidents, which are blighting people's lives. And he's a former doctor and a policeman, and he, he understands yeah. what policing is. This is the section which caused from me the biggest raising of an eyebrow when I heard Lawrence Fox say it. I was like, I need to look at who this Harry Miller is. Because Lawrence Fox seemed to be saying he wants to establish him as the chief of the Met Police and he's singing his praises, a former doctor, a former policeman. Wow, who is this guy? And I looked into it and Harry Miller is a former police officer from Humberside who has not been a policeman. If his LinkedIn is to be believed, In over 20 years, he's not been a policeman since pre-2000. Since then, he's been a management consultant. He's been the co-founder of a plant and machinery dealership. And he's now listed as a freelance activist. Now, the reason why Harry Miller came to Lawrence Fox's attention is because he put out uh, some tweet limericks that were about trans people and basically slagging them off. It was like a poem that says, your breasts are not real. Everyone hates you. We want you out of the world. What are you going to do? That's, I just made that up, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of limericks he posted. And it was in his role as a management consultant that the police, that he was reported to the police for this. In an interview with the Daily Telegraph, Harry Miller said, and I'll say it in a voice of a Yorkshire voice. I don't know if it's from Yorkshire, but this is just the voice that I do. I'm just a hairy ass docker who swears, drinks and watches football. But I have a wife, a mother and daughters. When it comes to their rights and safety and those of women everywhere, men need to speak up. And this is the guy that Lawrence Fox thinks should be the chief of the Metropolitan Police. So he's the guy who's tried to get the hate crime classification removed in the court, right? And he's also the person that says we need to stand up for women's rights and safety wouldn't removing hate crime against women be counterproductive if what you're trying to do is protect women's rights yes <laughs> and also just to give just to give listeners some context the chief of the met police at this time was Cressida dick she joined the met police in 1983 in the mid 1990s she was chief superintendent and then area commander for oxford 2003 Head of Operation Trident, investing gang and gun-related crime. 2009, Specialist Crime Director. She trained as a hostage negotiator. 2011, Counter-Terrorism Operations. 2017, Commissioner of the Met Police. Think how much shit she's done in the police in order to work her way up to Chief of Met Police. And Lawrence, for his part, is putting forward a guy who was a policeman over 20 years ago. But happens to not like trans people. And who isn't a policeman now. Yeah. (laughs) Luckily, this thing that I picked up on, the interviewer picked up on. He understands yeah. what policing is. But you, without he's, fear or he's not a copper, so you can't make a non-policeman uh, the, the chief of the, of the metropolis, which is that job. I mean, that, that's that's a job that goes to a policeman, isn't it? So you can't really replace Crest, Crested Dick with a civilian. Well, I met an assistant 
commissioner the other day when you know as a mayor you get to, as a mayoral candidate you get to meet mm. the uh, police and I went to go meet the police the other day and there was lots of funny words coming out of his mouth like safe spaces and various and after a while I said is the Metropolitan Police an anti-racist organisation and he said yes I thought you are fired too chum <laughs> not answering the question at all so just to highlight he's been asked how do you expect to make someone who's not a policeman chief of Met Police and in response to that Lawrence Fox goes on a tangent that he met someone from the police who said they represented anti-racism and he didn't like it. Is his point that all the senior police people are going to be fired and, and therefore he'll have to get himself from outside? Well, if it is, he's not saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Again, politician answer. Don't answer the question. Spin the question. Yeah. Move on to something that you want to say to your audience. And then the interviewer comes back again. Well, that's, that's not fair because they, 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 of course, they're anti-racist. That, that, no, I mean, the ma- we, the mess. You can't say no. that. No, and anti-racism is racism. It's got to stop. It's wokery gone mad. It's just rejigging language. We need not racist is better. Yes, but imagine if you... Anyway, let's not do racist. Okay, let's look at it. I mean, yeah, I think it's a, false, it's a false question because he couldn't say the other way, could he, obviously? He's not going to say otherwise, is he? He's not going to say he's pro-racist. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny hearing Chopper get more and more flustered with Lawrence Fox. Like, realising this guy is stupider than I even thought. (laughs) Do you have the appetite for public administration, Lawrence Fox? Do I have the appetite for public administration? Which is what your job's about, because it's not all about, about, well, showing off, but to put it bluntly, but it's about actually doing the hard yards of of ministering. If you ask someone, are you anti-racist? And they say, yes, I am. You're like, well, you're fired from your job. (laughs) What the fuck kind of dialogue is that for a mayor to be having with civil servants? <laughs> well, if, if Lawrence Fox had become the mayor, if people ask him, are you anti-racist? He would say, no, I'm racist. Well, <laughs> well if, if there was someone who, who was asked, are you anti-racist? And the person said, no, I'm pro-racist. <laughs> Lawrence Fox would be like, well, he's the deputy chief commissioner now. I've got my second, got my second person I want to hire. You could talk about the way you feel about the word anti-racism. You could talk about the way you feel about the woke or so-called woke police force, this is a politician doing everything he can, up to and including going off on completely unrelated tangents in order to not address the very thing that he's been asked, which relates to his main policy. One of the main things he said he would do on this first day of becoming mayor, he doesn't want to tell you that, or he doesn't want to defend that. Like so many other things, this whole conversation really shows that He has no policy solutions for any problems. His whole political career is built on controversies and on Twitter. He never thinks things through enough to have models. He has no idea about stats. He has no idea how things actually work. He has no experience running a team. He has no political experience. Like He has no idea how to do any of this shit. He just says things that will appeal to populist right-wing voters, right? Yeah. Another of Lawrence Fox's key policies was six months of free travel on all buses and on tube services for Londoners. And Chopper asks him how he's going to fund that policy. I mean, the question which any politician would have to answer then, given all that, is how on earth are you going to bail TfL out of this black hole? Because these things are not are not things I imagine that uh, Sadiq Khan wants to do, but he's got to do them, hasn't he? Because he's got the settlement with the Treasury. Well, it's fascinating that uh, the Tories will apply uh, modern monetary theory to their own government and they'll print more than a billion pounds a day off to go, yeah, no, it's fine, 407 billion, who cares? Magic monetary, we'll do it. But they make Sadiq Khan serve them as a result of ancient monetary theory which is like if you pay for it if you want it you've got to pay for it but it's um to so you borrow more essentially as you're saying aren't you but borrow to, to cut to fund these I, cuts, I, I borrow more i i don't think you do the the, the, the money the, the way the research that we've done in which is very very detailed research you know because if you give people six months free travel on the tube 80 to 100 percent occupancy it pays for mm-hmm. itself after a year so you've got another free year so i looked at his manifesto and it's lots of bullet points about different money that gets borrowed for different things but i can boil it down for listeners it equates to sadiq khan has two billion pounds more headroom to borrow money so lawrence fox is going to borrow that money and do the transport thing. And the thing that occurred to me is, you have no idea what's going to happen in the next however many years. We could like see a terrorist attack where we need to bulk up security. These projects cost money that has to be borrowed. It doesn't mean you just take that money and just definitely spend it on this random wacky idea. Also, there's no, as far as I'm aware, plan for how he's going to pay that money off, right? So basically, people in London pay council tax, and a part of your council tax 
goes not to your local council, but to the mayor's office in London, right? The amount of council tax that councils can charge residents, the maximum is set by the government. So if you go into office as a mayor of London, borrow the maximum amount that you can, but have no new plans for bringing in revenue, that means that you will you'll never have the headroom again. Like, how are you going to pay that off? And this is it. I think Lawrence Fox often talks about socialists living in their own world, in their own universe, separate from the actual real concerns of uh, the way the world works. This is such an example of him being that exact caricature. You've made a scheme to make free travel for six months, which is a massive risk. You're doing it on the back of a massive gambit that we might get more money in the economy in other places it's a fool's errand, this whole thing. And not only that, but this dichotomy of criticizing the government for borrowing loads of money, using that as a legitimization to borrow yet more money. If you think it's bad, why are you going to do it? Yeah. Also, I'd love it if they made travel free in London. That would be great. I could get around London for free. That'd be perfect. But Like, if you were intent on borrowing two billion pounds, there are probably a lot more useful things that you could do with that two two billion pounds to improve people's lives, more targeted for people who actually need it. Okay, that's so that's that's the six months free travel policy. Last thing I want to talk about just to play you because this is the most this is the most David Brent, Alan Partridge style answer we get in this interview. Lawrence Fox gets a question about Scottish independence and a vote that's going to go on in uh, in that time frame. So th- here's the question, and here's how he responds. They're voting in Scotland uh, uh, tomorrow. What's your approach to Scottish independence? Um, I, I, I think it's... It, I've got a personal view, obviously, and I've yeah. got a professional view. My professional view is that I don't get to vote in the election, so it's none of my business. Mm-hmm. And my personal view is if you get stuck in a truck in the outback in the middle of Australia, stay with your truck. Don't go looking for water. What does, <laughs> What's that mean, Lawrence? What does that mean? What it mean? What it means is that you know, are we stronger together, you know, or, or, or are we better apart? And, and I'm, I, because I love the family and I believe in, you know, these boring things like mums and dads and all of that stuff. I'm like, let's stay together if we can. But that's my view. And also okay. Scottish people can take a pop of me all they want. I don't mind. Okay. I don't get to vote. So it doesn't matter. One, massive word salad. Makes no <laughs> sense. Two, very funny of him to say, I love the family and believe in the boring things like mubs and dads and staying together when he's literally been taken to court by his ex-wife, Billy Piper, for custody of their children because he's such a dick. He's defined by his divorce, yeah. man. You're the divorce guy. That's what we all call you behind your back. That's what your mates call you. They call you the divorce guy. Oh, is he the Billy Piper guy? Oh, no, he's not because he's divorced from her now. <laughs> if he didn't want to answer the question, here's a perfectly refined, fine response to that question. That's for the people of Scotland to decide. I'm focused on the issues here in London. Perfect. And also, that's a way a politician would have that answer. Yeah. Like, it's fair fair enough he doesn't want to get involved, but you don't have to start telling this weird story about a truck in Australia. He also goes into it saying, I've got a personal view and a professional view, but then doesn't tell us what either of those views are. Yeah. (laughs) I've got a personal view and a professional view. My personal view is that families are great, and it's great if families can stay together, and you shouldn't leave a truck in the outback in Australia. (laughs) It's like, wow, what did that correspond to out of what you just said? So now we move on to current era Lawrence Fox and his bid for the by-election in Uxbridge and South Ryslip. What I appreciate about this guy, what I respect about this guy, gotta respect, is that no matter how many electoral punches to the face he takes, he is now running again for... Boris Johnson's seat and using all the same tactics that he's used in previous elections. The other candidates standing in this race are Steve Tuckwell, who is a Conservative candidate. We have Danny Beals representing Labour. We also have Blaise Bakish, who's a Lib Dem. And I guess the difference between Lawrence Fox and all these candidates is they already serve some sort of role in government, in councils. And more specifically, both Steve Tuckwell and Danny Beals have a very good idea about the inner political workings of Uxbridge and South Ryslip. They represent people in those areas already. They already do public sector tasks. Polling report UK currently indicates that Labour are pulling ahead of Conservatives by 13 points. Uh, They're at 52%. Conservatives are at 37%. We have uh, Lib Dems on 5%, Greens on 4%. And Lawrence Fox is not on this poll. (laughs) Because I imagine he's not polling high enough to even be included. Okay, so on the 24th of June, Fox released a campaign video which was supposed to make his case to local voters in Uxbridge and South Ryslip about why they should vote for him. And his mate, so 
he starts with a long introduction about who he is, why people know him, like he was on TV, blah, blah, blah. He went on Question Time, got cancelled. Then... After all of that, which is about half the video, then he starts making his political case, which starts with, I'm not a politician. I don't want to be. It's like, well, you're literally, you're literally asking people to elect you as a politician. You can't say, I don't want this job. You know, I'll do it. If I have to do it, I will. Paraphrase. I, will I refuse to engage in the tasks associated with this job. Yes. If you were interviewing someone, like in a job interview, and they came in and they were like, 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 I'm not a software engineer. I don't want to be. Nor do I want to be. Those so- those people are so stuck up and shit. I would <laughs> yeah. never be one of those. <laughs> and All and right? he like, literally in the whole video makes no local policy pledges. He doesn't seem to know about any local issues. He references that he once filmed some TV work in the local area. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but we all know that this campaign is not about the votes. Lawrence Fox has said as much himself, it's not about votes. He's about attention on Twitter. And boy, has he received a big fat load of that. At the moment, as, as, as we record this podcast now on the 25th of June, this is the centerpiece of his campaign. This is the thing that most people are talking about related to his campaign. He burned a pride flag. He, he burned a pride, he burned bunting made of a pride progress flags by pouring some sort of flammable fuel over them and then holding a lighter to them. He struggled on a few of the later ones, I know. Yes. I wouldn't say it was the most successful flag burning I've ever seen. Do we do we not have a take where, you know, you just go smoothly down the line and burn them? <laughs> oh, well, I guess we'll have to go with this one then. And he also refers to the flag as the child mutilation flag. Let me say that I've got a few curiosities about this timeline and the arguments presented by Lawrence Fox in the aftermath of this. So he burnt the pride flag on the 18th of June, which was Father's Day. Where were the kids, Lawrence? Don't worry, we all know. On the 19th of June, he released a follow-up video saying that he supports the rainbow side of the flag, but not the black bit because it divides us by uh, race and it's racial segregation. And his least favorite part is, and he points to like the trans triangle part of the flag, and he says, the child mutilation part of the flag. That's the worst bit. I have a musing about this, which is, in that same video where he's burning the pride flag, he's also wearing a t-shirt. The t-shirt has an LGBT rainbow on it, which does not include the trans triangle. So true. And the t-shirt has a little slogan underneath it that said, pride comes before the fall. Where has Lawrence got that t-shirt from? He made it. Really? You can go online and get one of these on Facebook. You can have it in a, in a variety of colours because um, we're good that way. Because pride is, does come before a fall. Anyway, go, yeah. What were you saying? He did a follow-up tweet a few days later holding the rainbow LGBT flag without the trans triangle saying, I just dug this out. I support this flag. First of all, no, you didn't dig out that cheap pride flag from a cupboard or something. It's the kind of flag that you get on the way through a train station at Pride Month. None of us hold on to those flags longer than the day that we got them on. It's a cheap flag, it goes in the bin. There's no point keeping that around your house. You'll get another one next year, don't worry. (laughs) So first of all, that's bullshit. But if you support the rainbow flag and only hate the trans bit, why did you make a t-shirt all the way back in what, March of this year? that doesn't show the trans bit and just shows the rainbow and said pride comes before the fall. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's an issue that a lot of right-wingers come up against in their homophobia is that the British public actually are all, not all, are almost all on board with people being able to love who they love, right? That's, it's Mm. pretty, it's pretty universal that people think that, you know, that respect gay rights basically, right? Yeah. The jury is a bit more out on trans issues, right? So mm. if you get caught in an LGBT controversy where you say something like homophobic, it's quite a classic maneuver to say, oh, I'm actually just mad at these gender ideology yeah, overreach. Yeah, exactly. And the, the plot goes deeper. He posted a tweet in that same time that said this We have a flag which represents us all and a flag which unites us all all skin colors, all regions, all sexualities. 
many brave men and women served under it and have died for it. We should be thankful every day for this flag. And he posts an emoji of the Union Jack. (laughs) Now, what occurs to me is that you could make that same argument for the LGBT flag, which you say you love, Lawrence. You saw right, other days after, you said you loved that flag. No one's fought and died in a war for that flag. It, it doesn't represent everyone in England. It only represents sexualities. So by the logic of your argument you're presenting here, you don't like the LGBT flag, but then you flip-flopped and said that you do really love the LGBT flag. <laughs> it doesn't, the logic of you making that t-shirt, you making those statements doesn't make sense. With that post that you love the rainbow flag. Yeah. And I think what Lawrence Fox relies on is that the people who like him are quite dumb. Like, they, they, they're not interested in nuance or, or issues, really, at all. They're just interested in someone saying something quite mean about people that they agree with. And, yeah. like, like, and, it, and he can very quickly move on to whatever his new stunt is, and none of them will care about that. But... The issue for Lawrence Fox is that that group of people is quite small. What I describe it as is Twitter is an idiot magnet. You can be on Twitter as the most far left or far right person in existence and have the most harebrained ideas about society. And you will attract all the idiots, not just from your own country, but from Brazil, from America, from Mozambique. You can get some people, you know? (laughs) And Lawrence's tweets and his statements are, within the world of idiot magnets, he's the biggest one. Yeah. It gives you the, the appearance of widespread unilateral support for all these things he tweets, but it's just all the weirdos from all around the world grouped in one place on one account. Yeah. And I think that shows in his electoral history, right? Like, I mean, yeah. in the London mayor elections that we touched on earlier, people don't actually want him to be their elected politician. Some people just like gawking at him on Twitter. I think that's just, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the extent of his usefulness, isn't it? Yeah. What are we expecting to see, Aiden? Yeah, I was actually going to say. So let's look at what the, how many people voted in Uxbridge and R- Rice yeah, last Yeah, look time. at previous, look at previous votes. When Boris Johnson was re-elected in Uxbridge and South Rice in 2019, Boris Johnson won with 25,000 votes. Labour got 18,000 votes. The Libs Dems got 3,000 and the Green Party got 1,000. I would like to make a solid prediction here. I think we can expect Labour's share of the vote to go up because of the polls. And Labour is polling much higher now against the Tuckwell guy than it was against Boris in the last few months of Boris's tenure. So Lawrence Fox got... He got approximately 40,000 votes in the whole of London when the turnout was millions, right? Mm. This, the electorate here is 70,000. In that um, Boris Johnson, when the last time he got elected, the UK Independence Party stood in that election. So UKIP, anti-immigration, conservatives aren't going far enough, culture war issues. That UKIP candidate got 283 votes. I think we will see Lawrence get somewhere in the same region. Let's put some money on it. I'll say 300. Do you want to throw out a number and then whoever's closer, fiver? Yeah, hold on. Let me just do some maths, mate. Oh, this guy's got, this guy's a scientist. Aiden's got his little scientific calculator. If any of you are wondering what's going on right now, Aiden's, Aiden's scribbling a quadratic equation <laughs> on a board behind him. He looks insane. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm actually going to say that I think Lawrence Fox might get 700 votes. Shake on it. Yeah, should we... Sh- <laughs> those of you who, who missed it i just shook shook my shook my shoulders in a little jig behind the camera i did it too because i'm confident about my bet i'm really confident i'm more confident about this than the fact that lawrence fox's marriage will never get back together wow <laughs> you think you think there's a higher chance of him getting back with billy piper than who is than him getting 700 votes in this election i think there's a bigger chance of billy piper giving him full custody of the children <laughs> than him doing well in this election That wraps it up, right? Okay. Well, thank you very much for tuning in. We hope you've all enjoyed this episode. I think, well, for me, Aiden, this has been a joy. It's been very fun. Yeah, I've loved this one. He's a comical character that you can, that's that's fun to find out about all the ridiculous things that he's been saying. And he poses almost no threat on a political level because he's never going to (laughs) win. Well, let's, you know, a man, as Chopper summarized, Lawrence Fox probably won't win in Uxbridge and Ryslip, but a man can dream. 
All right, well, thanks everyone for tuning in. We love all of you YouTube commenters and anyone else listening to any on listen to this podcast on any other platforms. We love you equally. Stay safe out there. And Aiden, I'll I'll leave you to do the bye. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Jumping off the.